if you kind of reduce down your activity levels over weeks and months, mm. well, that naturally can lead to deconditioning of your back. The less you do, the less you're able to do. Welcome to another episode of the HSC Talking Health and Wellbeing podcast. My name is Eamon Kyo. Today we're talking about low back pain, the different types of low back pain, things you can do to relieve pain, and some tips to help with flexibility. I'm delighted to welcome Susan Murphy, a clinical specialist physiotherapist with the HSE based in orthopedics in University Hospital Waterford, to help us better understand low back pain and what causes it. You're very welcome, Susan. Thank you very much. So, Susan, just getting straight into it, what is low back pain? Well, low back pain is pain that is centred between your ribs and your pelvis, and it can spread either to one leg or the other leg. Okay. And is there different types of back pain? Generally, lower back pain, in medical terms, we can define it as maybe mechanical back pain, or often people refer to it as simple low back pain as well. And obviously then we can have acute low back pain and chronic low back pain. Okay. And is there a difference or what is the difference really? Yeah, acute low back pain is back pain that generally gets better within about six weeks. It comes on very suddenly, often can be a very acute and debilitating pain, but generally it will settle down. Some people will get better within two or three days. Some people will get better within a week or two weeks, but most people are improved and better within about six weeks and generally then may not have an episode again for several years or down the line. Okay. And I often hear the term sciatica used in relation to back pain. Would you mind just explaining that term? Yep, sciatica is where the pain is centred more in your leg rather than your back. And it is a form of back pain, but it's where the nerve is involved. And so the leg pain, it's very severe leg pain. Yeah. And that the leg is greater than the back. And generally it can take a lot longer than mechanical back pain to get better. With mechanical back pain, the dominant pain is your back pain and you may get some leg pain. With sciatica, the dominant pain is the leg pain, which can spread right down to your calf and foot and that the back pain is not so severe. And often with sciatica, you may get pins and needles or numbness associated with that. And it's often secondary to a significant disc problem in your back. Okay. And should you seek medical help for that or does it settle itself? Generally, with sciatica, you probably will need to seek medical help because often the pain is very severe and takes a while to settle. So often you will need some level of medication to control the symptoms and some direction from your GP as to what to do and how to manage it. So you would consult with your doctor quite quickly with sciatica. And Susan, how common is low back pain in Ireland? Low back pain is very common. Approximately 80% of people will suffer with episodes of back pain at some stage in their lives. But the good news is that most episodes do settle quickly with not a lot of treatment. But it is common. And I'm sure we all know people who suffered with their backs. Yeah, yeah. Including myself, I have to say. (laughs) (laughs) And who does it mostly affect It can affect anybody, but generally it's most common in middle age, in the age group 40 to 60. And generally they also, there is some statistics that it affects women more than men. Generally, there are lots of lifestyle factors that can contribute to the development of back pain. Is it more common in older people? Generally, back pain is more common in that middle age. And as people get older, back pain often becomes less of a problem. And there are several reasons for this. Often during middle age, first of all, the wear and tear process in our backs is more active at that time. We're often more demanding on our backs at that stage in our life because we're trying to work, we're minding family, we're busy with things. And often, too, at that middle age, we've less time for ourselves and exercise is good for back pain, but often people may not be as active at that stage. As people get older, yeah. spine tends to fuse, so it causes less of a problem. And then also often we're maybe not working, we've less demands in our back, we've more time for ourselves. So the back tends to be less of a problem. 
And that's good news for people because often people sit in front of us as, as clinicians in their 40s and 50s with persistent and severe back pain and think, well, if I'm like this now, what am I going to be like in another 20 years? Yeah. But in fact, a lot of the time, the back pain, it goes through phases where it's not so good. But a lot of the time, as people get older, it does improve, it, it does become less of a problem and less symptomatic. OK. And are some people more predisposed to back pain than others? Not particularly. It's very much lifestyle driven. Okay. Um, it can run in families. There is some evidence that back pain can run. And we certainly see patients who say to us, oh, my sister had a bad back or my father has a bad back. And also then a lot of the time it is more due to wear and tear and lifestyle factors. What type of lifestyle factors would you be talking about? I'm, I'm also conscious that we seem to spend a lot more time sitting now. I know the new National Physical Activity Guidelines were recently launched and they included sedentary behaviour. Could you talk a little bit about those lifestyle factors? Yeah, you're absolutely right, Eamon, that being sedentary and lack of exercise is a factor that can influence and impact on people developing back pain. A lot of the time now, and particularly with COVID and post-COVID, people working from home don't have to leave their houses from one end of the day to the other. The people have become more sedentary and yeah. this can be a factor that leads to back pain. So certainly the evidence is, is not being active. Not taking regular exercise is another factor. Being active, taking regular exercise helps your back. And again, if you're not doing regular exercise, it can contribute to you developing back pain. The other thing is people who are overweight, deconditioned, another factor that can contribute to why you might develop back pain. As I mentioned earlier, family history, that there may be a factor there. The evidence is is muted as to the effect of physical work and whether heavy loading and physical work. But certainly people who work in very physical jobs on a regular basis may be more at risk of developing back pain as well. So it's those people who are very sedentary and don't move and yeah. those people maybe who work in heavy work. Yeah, we will talk about exercises in a minute, but just getting up and moving a little bit every hour, is it? Or Yeah, what's important is to get up and move around on a regular basis. And I suppose the other thing is to try and get some form of exercise in at some stage in the day, even if it's to walk for 10 or 15 minutes before you start work. Yeah. Even in the, at lunchtime to get out and have a walk or certainly in the evening to do some form of exercise. So getting up and moving regularly, but also doing some form of short exercise in the day. Yeah. And what about you know, posture and the way you sit and things like that? There isn't any huge evidence that the way you sit greatly impacts on whether you develop back pain or not. It's yeah. more about moving and getting up and moving. OK. And are there any other factors that contribute to low back pain? Certainly, if back pain persists and is ongoing for a length of time, well, naturally, you know, back pain can be a very worrisome because back pain is severe, it wears you out, can impact not only on your physical health, but also on your mental health as such. Yeah. If it's not getting better and not understanding it, it can lead to worry and anxiety around it. If you're not able to work on a regular basis, that can lead to worry and anxiety around your back and if you can get back to work. Often going to medical practitioners and, you know, all that can be mm. difficult as well and lead to worry. So often worry and anxiety around it can make it worse and often not really understanding the nature of the problem and what you need to do around it can exacerbate and make the whole pain worse as yeah, well. Yeah, I know myself. I mean, I've had a few episodes of back pain, but when it hits, it's it's just that sense of panic or dread or what am I after doing to myself or I can't move. And Absolutely. It's a very worrying, you know, back pain can be very debilitating. It's very acute. Yeah. And certainly it's a fearful thing and people don't want it to recur. If it impacts on your ability to be able to work and do things, you certainly feel I don't want this to happen again. Often the less you do over a long bit, it's fine if that goes on for a couple of weeks. But if you kind of reduce down your activity levels over weeks and months, mm. well, that naturally can lead to deconditioning of your back. Yeah. And also I find as well, you try and compensate or change, as you say, the way you do things, limit your exercise or, or your involvement in things to help your back get better. But that's not necessarily the right thing to do either, as you said. No, absolutely not. Obviously, if we have back pain, yeah. um, because it's sore to move, we move less. Yeah. And 
that's fine if we do that for a short period of time. But back pain for some people can go on over months and years. Mm. If you do less, then your back becomes stiffer. Then your back becomes weaker. When you go to do things, you get more pain. And so as a result, then you do less. What we call this is a vicious cycle of inactivity in that the less you do, the less you're able to do. Yeah. The more deconditioned you become, you put on weight and then you go to move your back and it hurts so much you think, oh, I better not move it. Yeah. Whereas in fact, it's become deconditioned and that's why it hurts to move and to understand that and to get direction as to what I can do to move it and to help it and yeah. to strengthen it. And you mentioned the difference there between acute and and chronic back pain. But when should you seek medical advice? Is it after two to three weeks or does it depend how severe the pain is? It depends how severe the pain is. I suppose if you have an episode of acute back pain that's very severe and debilitating, well, within a couple of days, you're probably going to go to your GP to get some form of medication to help control the pain. And generally with acute back pain, that's often all you need is some medication. And also, I suppose the advice is keep active within the realms of what you're able. Stay at work if you can. And gradually, as the pain settles, try and resume normal activity. With yeah. persistent back pain or with other episodes, if it's not settling within two to three weeks, you'll probably be taking medication at that stage. And then you may seek out the help of a chartered physiotherapist, your GP be able to direct you. But ideally, if you have back pain, you haven't had it before or you have it, but it seems to be getting worse within about two to three to four weeks, you probably should seek out some form of management for that problem to help you what to do. Okay. And what investigations are required for the mechanical low back pain? Yeah, generally there's no routine investigations are not indicated really, particularly short lived episodes of back pain. You okay. certainly don't need them. If back pain is persisting and ongoing yeah. and the symptoms are very severe, there may be an indication for investigations. X-ray is not indicated for people with low back pain. It gives very little information medically. All right. And MRI is of the lumbar spine is what would, would be indicated, but it's not indicated routinely. It's only indicated really if symptoms are persisting and ongoing over a long period of time or if somebody has severe and significant leg pain, as mm. we discussed earlier, sciatica, right. not improving in three to four weeks with maybe pins and needles or numbness an MRI would be indicated at that point. Or if the problem persists over weeks and months, you would definitely for sciatica have an MRI done. Okay. And just to ask you about another term, I often hear people talking about bulging discs. What does that mean? So most people, you know, who have MRIs, they get the report back or they'll talk to their, their doctors will talk to them about the MRI and the MRI will show in the lower back that the likelihood is they will have bulging discs at different levels, particularly the lower part is what we call the L4, 5, L5, S1. That's your lumbar vertebra. Bulging discs or having changes on your MRI are normal. It is normal as we get older in, into middle age, into your 40s, into your 50s. It's normal that you will have changes on an MRI because it's normal aging changes. So everybody who has an MRI, as we say to patients, it would be abnormal to have an MRI that came back and said that you had a perfect spine. It doesn't matter what age you are. Yeah. There will always be disc bulges, disc protrusions. They are a normal part of aging. It's the extent of the disc bulge or the disc protrusion that we're particularly interested in. So again, we'd often have people who would come to us and say, oh, well, I haven't been doing anything because I have a disc bulge in my back. And we would say, oh, no, that that's OK. That's normal. It's OK to move and it's OK to exercise with your disc bulges. Yeah. It's well, a normal part of wear. It's like in your knee or in your hip. Yeah. You get normal wearing as you get older but it doesn't mean you can't exercise and move and do things. Back to that pain piece. Yes. If yeah. you have pain, then you manage that. Absolutely. And often you need to get advice. Like what's really important is going to your GP, going to a chartered physio, who will assess and determine the relevance of the MRI with your clinical symptoms yeah. and then decide the best treatment plan for you. Okay. Maybe just moving back to the management of low back pain for a minute and how people can help themselves there. Any tips? Well, as I said, um, 
earlier, being active and taking regular exercise, there isn't any evidence that any one form of exercise is better than any other form of exercise when it comes to back pain. It's just being active and taking regular exercise. So we would encourage people to try if walking is their thing, that they would try and walk on a regular basis. Ideally, we all know that we're supposed to do 150 minutes of exercise a week. So yeah. we'd say to people, well, try and get out and walk maybe 50 minutes, three days a week or half an hour, five days a week. Again, we have our guidelines with regard to steps and mm. we ideally 10,000 steps a day. So again, to encourage people within the realms of what their symptoms allow to try and walk on a regular basis. Okay. And what about running? Yeah, running is a bit more vigorous. So depending on the extent of the symptoms, it certainly wouldn't be a starting point in yeah. any way. Yeah. And a lot of people with back pain running may be too vigorous. But certainly if it's something that somebody does and it doesn't seem to bother their back, they mm. certainly can continue to do that. Okay. Other forms of exercise then would be swimming. Swimming is good for people with back problems. And generally cycling, there's again no evidence that one type is, it's what you're comfortable with and what you like to do. And the whole thing is to try and engage and do exercise. And the whole reason you're doing exercise is because it's aerobic and it's good for your conditioning. And you're trying to condition and get your back fit again. Because as I said earlier, no flush people have this persistent ongoing back pain because they have become deconditioned around it. Yeah. And are there any back specific exercises that people can do, you know, to build up the strength in your low back? With lower back pain, as I said, a lot of people get stiff and they get weak. And then they've become deconditioned. So the type of exercise you're trying to str you're trying to do conditioning for your fitness. You're trying to do some flexibility exercise to keep your movement. And generally, as you get into your 50s, into your 60s, into your 70s, your back has become a bit stiffer. So you need to try and move it regularly and simple stretches, which we outline in our recent booklet we produced on persistent low back pain. And then also you need to probably do a strengthening program for your back. And again, often a chartered physiotherapist would give you direction with regard to the strengthening program. Things also that you can do independently without having to seek help would be things like Pilates and yoga, which yeah. are back specific exercise. So walking, swimming, cycling are generally conditioning exercise, whereas yoga and Pilates actually move and stretch your back and they actually strengthen your back. So they're back specific. So they probably would be more targeted to try and help your back. Very good. And actually, just to mention, the HSE have produced a number of free exercise videos on Pilates and yoga. And these are available on the HSE Health and Wellbeing YouTube channel. So for anyone that wants to to have a look at those. Maybe, Susan, just you mentioned the booklets there. And I'd just like to ask you about the two new back pain booklets that you've produced. One is Acute Low Back Pain, A Guide to Understanding Acute Low Back Pain. And then the other one is Persistent Low Back Pain, A Guide to Understanding Persistent Low Back Pain. Yeah, as clinicians and who are working with people with back pain, giving people understanding of the back pain and how to manage it is hugely important. Yeah. And Susan, I have to say they're fantastic booklets. I assume you had a team putting this together. Yes, this was a collaboration between the HSE and the Irish Society of Chartered Physiotherapists. And there was a team of physiotherapists and we consulted with GPs and other healthcare practitioners to gather together information that would help people understand and manage their persistent and acute low back pain. It's funny, it's simple and there's so much in it, but it takes a lot of collaboration to put something like this together, doesn't it? Absolutely. And it took a long number of months to put it together and to get the best evidence based information into this booklet and to have a resource for people that they can use independently with some lovely tailored exercises and an exercise log that they can follow in the booklet. Very good. And you worked with uh, some of your colleagues in the HSE on it as well? Yes, I did. Yeah. Like myself, colleagues who have a special interest in the management of low back pain. And we hope this booklet does help to take the fear out of back pain and give you the understanding of why you might have it and what you can do to help yourself. It talks through the vicious cycle of inactivity and how that might contribute and also how you might get a bit low because of this back pain and your inability to do things with friends and family and all of that. 
It's funny, the other thing I notice when you injure your back, obviously if you break your leg, people can see it. But when you injure your back, it's not an obvious injury. So you might get less sympathy actually, or just people tend to move on quicker with, oh, is that still hurting you? Well, this is it. And and this is what patients say to us an awful lot is that initially often there's great sympathy for their backs. But then if it persists and is ongoing, patients often tend to hide it rather than as well, rather than to talk about it. And they tend to maybe isolate a little bit and do less and they feel they're impacting other people's ability to enjoy things. So they maybe don't participate or go to things. Yeah. And that all perpetuates the problem, makes it worse for people, too. So, yeah, it's right when you can't see it. Often people don't have that sympathy around it. Yeah, yeah. Just with getting back to the booklet, there are then some simple back stretches in the booklet as well that people can do. So it's very good from that point of view on page 22 and 23. There's back exercises that people can follow. And then there's a little exercise log on the next page where you can log out your exercises and how often you do them and that. I thought that was really helpful, actually, because for me as well, just keeping track of the exercises that you do. Well, I think the log is good because what is important is I think people, again, need to understand the concept of, you know, we say it's like a diet. If you're trying to lose weight, if you diet one day a week and eat what you want the other six days. Yeah. Well, then the diet probably is going to have much benefit. Yeah. And it's exactly the same if you need to do exercise exercises or exercise for your back if you only do them once a week and then they're not going to have any huge impact. You don't need to often do them every day because most people don't exercise every single day. Yeah. But three or four times a week to do some level of stretching, particularly as people get older, if their backs feel stiff, if they do these simple stretches three or four days a week to keep that flexibility of mobility, well, then that would maintain it. And as you said in the booklet, uh, they're lovely illustrations, actually. They're very simple and easy to follow. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So there's lots of information. And this yeah. booklet can be found on healthpromotion.ie. The search term is low back pain and you'll get up both the acute and persistent low back pain booklets. Very good. And just to mention as well that those resources are free. And as you say, they're available to order or download as well. Isn't that right? They're, you don't, Absolutely. Yeah. Yes, you can download them and they're free. Very good. And just also to mention for healthcare professionals in particular, the HSC have a great set of exercise videos designed for people with chronic conditions. And these again are on our HSC Health and Wellbeing YouTube channel. So there's a good range of resources, free resources there for people um, in terms of the exercise videos, the booklets and the videos for people with chronic conditions. And can I ask how long you're working in this area? Oh, a long number of years. Yeah, absolutely. I've been in University Hospital Waterford for about 20 years and I worked in a back care program where we designed and developed exercise programs for people with back pain. And then I went on and did a PhD looking at back pain at exercise. So I have a very special interest in helping people with low back pain and helping people understand it and knowing what type of exercise to do to help themselves. Yeah, very good. I find myself when you've touched on it, your mentality as you're approaching or your mood, because it can really bring you down in terms of your mood, can't it? If it? Particularly if it persists over a number of weeks. Yeah, well, back pain can persist over weeks and months. I suppose we call it persistent back pain or chronic back pain greater than three months. Right. And so that's back pain that will go on and people can have back pain for, you know, years and years. It comes and goes, it waxes and wanes, exacerbates. But certainly it can not, it naturally then impacts, as we said, on your physical health. But yes, on your mental well-being as well, because like if you're not able to do things the way you were able to do them, if you're not able to do things with your family like you'd like to do, you feel guilty around that. If you're not able to work, you miss work. It may have a financial anxieties around that. If persistence is ongoing and impacts on your ability to do things and function on a daily basis, it naturally will impact on not only your physical health, but your mental well-being. And often that side of it is never really addressed or highlighted. And it is really important that, you know, if you feel that way, that's probably normal. And yeah. that ideally there are healthcare professionals that can help you to overcome that and, and show you through exercise and through other avenues to try and 
get back on track with things. Yeah. And from what you said there, it's little and often as opposed to trying to get back to where you were, be it exercise wise or, you know, in terms of physical activity. We have this big term that we use called hurt does not mean harm, you know. Right. So often when people, if they have pain, they start off to exercise. And the pain, actually, they perceive it gets worse and it makes it worse. But often that's not because of the underlying disbulge or the wear in your back. Mm. That's often because of the deconditioning that has occurred over time. So, for example, it's like people who are very unfit. And if they go to exercise and it's not easy initially, it's hard work, it's sweat, it's, you know, yeah. it takes a lot of effort. And often if they go and, and exercise the next day or the day after, they're going to be very sore, they're going to be very stiff. But it doesn't mean that they've done harm. It means that they've challenged their body in a way that they haven't for a while. Mm. And it can often be exactly the same with someone who's back pain, who hasn't been able to exercise for a long time. Because they've become stiff and weak, when they go to exercise, in fact, they feel the pain. And in fact, they feel pain the next day and the day after. But that doesn't mean that they're making the back problem worse. It means that they're challenged or moved their back in a way that they haven't moved it for a while. And it's often telling them, well, they actually need to move their back. Not that they shouldn't move it, yeah. but in fact that they need to move it. Just like the person who's unfit, it's not telling them they shouldn't do it. It's telling them, gosh, I need to do this. Yeah. So it's exactly the same with persistent back pain that often you need to be doing it with the direction and help of a healthcare professional like a chartered physiotherapist. Yeah. But actually, just going back to that, that was one thing that struck me when I was reading the booklet yeah. around that it's OK within reason, obviously, to have a little bit of pain if you're exercising after particularly uh, chronic back pain. Absolutely. It's not going to be a pain free exercise and that often it may, you know, you may trigger the pain or it may get worse for a little bit, but you're not doing harm. It's sore and it's painful to do it because you're stiff and you're weak and that as you do it more and work through that a little bit, it will become easier. Yeah. If I need to seek out health care advice, where should I go? Well, I suppose the first person most people will go to is their GP, where yeah. they'll get advice around medication and generally keeping active. If the pain persists and doesn't settle within a couple of weeks, well, a chartered physiotherapist is probably the first person that most people within the health service will go to. OK. And can physiotherapy help? Absolutely. So what a physiotherapist will do will generally assess the problem, see what the nature of the problem is give you a direction as to what you can do to help yourself with regard to the problem. They often will do some hands-on therapy, what we call manual therapy. They must give you an exercise program. Some physiotherapists use acupuncture and generally you'll be given an exercise program that you'll follow independently at home and they will review and progress over time. Generally what the physiotherapist is trying to correlate your symptoms and what you need to do. And most people will improve with over time, yeah. like again, depending on how long you've had the problem. And I suppose also if you have underlying wear and tear to some degree and you can get yourself conditioned, most people will improve. But for some people, persistent back pain, it's like being a diabetic. If you're a diabetic, you're a diabetic and you've got to live the lifestyle and you've got to manage it and you've got to do the right things. Yeah. And it's exactly the same for some people who have persistent back pain. It's a matter of it'll come and go with waxes and wanes. There's yeah. time it's better than other times but that overall if you don't live the lifestyle and try to do the right things it may escalate more yeah i think that's a really important point actually about getting professional advice from people who you know are qualified because again just going back to social media there's a lot of good information out there but there's also a lot of misinformation about home remedies or things you can do and it is good advice to go to a health professional who has the experience. A lot of the time people can go to lots of different people. With back pain, you get advice from lots of people. Oh, I went here and this was great and I went there and that was great. And different things work for different people. Yeah. But I suppose what is important is that people don't waste a lot of money going to practitioners where they don't seem to be improving and getting better. And ideally, you should show some improvement after two to three sessions with the practitioner. And if you're not seeing that, well, then you need to question the benefit of, of the treatment. Yeah. 
I mean, I know myself, when it gets very severe, you'd nearly try anything if somebody tells you. I mean, I remember my dad telling me, because he suffers from back pain, and he said to me, oh, the sting of a nettle really helped me. I liked it. Yes. You know, rationally, I go, why would I sting myself with a nettle? But when it's that sore. Yeah, absolutely. People have great beliefs in different de- alternative therapies and yeah. that, and they do work for some people. But we have to question if it's not helping. And ideally, your GP should be the person to help direct you as to what's best advice and best evidence for back pain. Yeah. And also, there's a lot of good free information there, like we mentioned earlier. And I suppose with back pain, chronic or persistent back pain that lasts longer than three months, just to put it in context, 80% of people with persistent back pain won't require any sort of intervention like surgery. Most people who have back problems can manage it with physiotherapy and themselves and what we call conservative management and don't require sort of specialist care. And that's, I suppose, different to say people who have arthritic hips and knees that, you know, arthritic hips and knees eventually, as people get into their late 60s or 70s, the joints will become more degenerative and often then they will require surgery. Whereas back pain, it's only a small percentage of people who require surgery for their backs. And most people, it is exercise and conservative management that helps. Okay. But for those, I suppose we should talk about who don't approve, are there treatment options available for them or what sort of treatment options yeah. are available? The two specialists that people would probably seek out is a pain specialist and then I suppose the other is a consultant spine specialist if that is considered. So a lot of people will go to a pain specialist where they be assessed and treatment would involve pain injections either into the joints or epidurals for the low back or also pain services often run what we call multidisciplinary pain management programs which address both the physical and psychological needs of the patient who has profound and persistent low back pain that's impacting on their quality of life over a long period of time. A lot of people will go to see a consultant spine surgeon for an opinion, particularly if they've had an MRI, which shows some level of wear in the back and that their back pain is persisting. Yeah, you were saying that that there's a very low percentage of people who would need spine surgery. Very few of those consultations will convert to actually requiring surgery. So a lot of people go to the specialist to get an opinion as to how they should manage their back problem but that in general, most people with, and particularly with mechanical back pain, will not require surgery. And that, but at least they'll have feel they've got the right opinion and that they know what pathway they should be on to help manage the problem. Okay. We're coming near the end of the podcast now, and I just wanted to ask you if there are any final messages you'd like to mention. Definitely. I suppose the key messages really are to keep active and take regular exercise and that and hopefully if you can do that, it'll prevent episodes of back pain or recurrence of episodes of back pain. Keeping your weight under control, that's really important. Yeah. Keep conditioned and the weight under control. And I suppose a big thing is don't worry mm. about back pain. I think so, that is a huge thing, actually. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. Don't worry. Most episodes get better. There's people out there that can help you to direct you as to what to do and not to do. So don't worry. I suppose the other thing is that our backs are strong. People have this impression that our backs are weak. Our backs are strong and by doing exercise, we can make them stronger. So again, don't be worried about doing Mm. things at home. Try and keep doing things within the realms of what you feel able. And I suppose the other thing is, which we said already, is seek health care advice early if your symptoms are not settling. If you have acute back pain within a few days, you may need to seek out help with regard to your GP with regard to medication. With regard to physiotherapy and treatment, if you have an acute episode of back pain that isn't settling, you might need to seek out treatment. In advance of that, you would just take some medication and try and just keep active yourself and keep doing things within the realms of what you're able. Yeah. Okay. Can I ask you as well, just about immediate relief or, you know, the way there's ice packs or hot packs that people use. Is one more effective than the other one or are they both as effective as well, each other? 
most people who have acute back pain find the heat is what, heat, they're, what right. their back likes. I'm not sure if there's any clinical evidence that heat is particularly effective, but certainly it's comforting, it's soothing, and yeah. most people would probably place heat packs on their back to help. Okay. And is there a certain amount of time you should leave it on for or is it? Generally, it'll it'll get cool anyway. So yeah. probably within about 15, 20 minutes, make sure you don't burn yourself. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. the important thing. Very good. I would like to thank Susan Murphy for joining me today to talk about this really interesting topic. To all our listeners, thank you for your continued support and please share this episode. If you would like more information about HSE Health and Wellbeing, follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, take a look at our HSE Health and Wellbeing YouTube channel, or register for our e-zine by emailing healthandwellbeing.communications at hse.ie. This has been the HSE Health and Wellbeing podcast. Thank you for listening.